uh, short in the second lecture, but uh, uh, could be rescheduled because people have other, some people have other appointments, but I would say that, uh, yes, yeah, so we have uh, a take, take break after this lecture, and uh, so, uh, please. Yes. Just please, again, remind me five minutes before I have to stop. Okay. So, um, the point was that <coughs> this was the definition of this <coughs> Fefferman, where we recognized what file and side were, and then what Hermander did was actually he recognized that this thing is nothing else but norming the k derivative of A, but with respect to a very particular inner, for, uh, inner product. And the inner product was exactly, where is my inner product? Yes. Was exactly generated like this. So, under the, under T1, uh, the inner product in Rn, so this is the first variable, the x, the little x, and this is the little xi, I put my uh, weight phi squared, and this is exactly the weight here, and then, I take the ordinary inner product with the, in the second variable, but I put my weight psi that gains growth when you differentiate it with respect to psi. So I put it down. And if I take the norm of the k derivative, the norm of the k derivative of a now, this is my a, with respect to this inner product, gx, what I get is exactly this. And then, now, it's obvious what to do. Now I define a new class. Like this. Uh, incidentally, uh, this is for one x. If I choose another x, right, I have to have a family of inner products, a family of inner products parameterized by this x. So for each x, I have an inner product. I have a full family of inner products parameterized by x. And with respect to this inner product, I norm the k derivative of x at x because the k derivative at x is the multilinear form that I normed. And this kind of a family of inner product, inner products, parameterized by x, is uh, called a Riemannian metric. Uh, you probably know it. If you don't, this is the definition. So, by definition, a Riemannian metric, so I won't be geometrically precise now, on purpose. Uh, so for me, a Riemannian metric, I'll denote it like this, g sub x, it's a map. such that from, from each x, I have an inner product. This uh, gx here is a bilinear map, so L2, aha. So this is not L2 like square integrable, but uh, two, two times linear, bilinear. So like this, one, well, like this thing was k, lk was k linear, this is two times linear, rn times rn. Two times linear map with bundles in R. And of course, I want to be a linear product. So this means that it has to be, uh, this uh, linear map has to be positive definite at every point and symmetric, right? Because that the linear product is exactly that a linear map which is positive definite at every point and symmetric. And uh, for technical reasons, you assume that it's also smooth as a map. Technically speaking, for the commander calculus, you don't need to be, it doesn't need to be smooth. It only needs to be measurable, but it doesn't matter. I'll assume that it's smooth. Uh, okay, uh, one more thing. Uh, I will denote, so, okay, because the, you know, uh, for each, so I will denote the corresponding quadratic form. For each x, I will denote by the, the corresponding quadratic form in the, by the same letter. So the quadratic form, 
gx of t is exactly this. So this is the norm of t with respect to this inner product. And this is a quadratic form now. And uh, I will, I'll use this notation. So the quadratic form, I will denote it by the same letter. OK. And now, the definition of the Formander symbol class, or the Weyl Formander symbol class, to be precise, is the following. by S, M, uh, and M here, this M will be a positive function on R to N, and this will be the order of the operator of the symbol. Remember, in the Schubin calculus, this was the bracket, X psi. In the rho delta calculus, this was the, just psi to the power mu. Here, it just in the bill Stefan was denoted by M, also denoted here by M. So this is a positive function, continuous, and I have a metric, G, a Riemannian metric. So for me, this just, for us, this thing reads uh, inner product at every point, nothing else. So you have an inner product at every point. Uh, because if, if I say Riemannian, met, Riemannian metric, it sounds scary, but it's just a bunch of inner products. So A belongs in a, this class S and G. If uh, I'll do this, I'll take the cage derivative and norm it with respect to the inner product GX. So this will be the k derivative at X, norm it with respect to the inner product. So this means that you assume that all of these are less than one with respect to G of X, or if you don't assume to be less than one, then you have to divide by the length. Right? Either you assume they have l l length less than one, or you don't assume that they have length less than one, but you, then you divide by the length. Because it's linear, right? I mean, in the, this is linear in every variable. So I can put it inside that, yeah. The, the, yellow problem. the length. Because uh, this thing, uh, just gx of tj is the length squared. Right? Because this is an inner product here. So gx of t is the length squared, so I have to take a square root of it. All of them, each of them less than one uh, length, or again, just divide with respect, uh, just divide with the length. And you take supreme over all t1 to tk in w. Uh, and then you take uh, Aha. Uh -huh. Okay, so for each k, so for each k, this is bounded. Aha, uh -huh. not bounded, but now it has to be bounded by, by the weight, m of x. Because previously I assumed that m was 1 there, when I started to, right? So again, just to, to, to see where, where it comes from, because this thing here is exactly this. and then you have your order uh, for each k. Okay, so, uh, and when you define it like this, this will become a fresh air space with these seminars, and this is all well and fine. And now the question is, uh, if I define it like this, are my symbols, are my symbols generating uh, operators that are continuous on S? Now this is the question. And the trick is that, uh, in general, they don't. You have to impose something on the metric. So your Riemannian metric cannot be totally arbitrary. You have to impose growth conditions on the metric, how fast it grows. So let, 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 us, let us write what we want from the calculus. 
Он был ванка на калкулус, то бил калкулус of operators. Something that all other calculators should be in the drop, commander, not delta, and all others satisfy, and then somehow we intuitively want them to satisfy. So what do we want? First, we want that the bell point is aha. So if I take A, then I want the bell quantization to be continuous from S into S. This is the one thing that I want. And also, equally important, I want for the, uh, I want the, when I take composition of two operators, I, to get again operator which is of symbols which you can represent as a symbol of these symbol classes. So in a sense, you want something like this. That if you start with an A, is in SM1. And B in SM2. And then, when you take their composition, because of the first condition, this is meaningful. Because otherwise, if you if you don't have this thing, so if it is only an operator from S into S prime, then this is meaningless, right? Because I cannot you cannot compose them, right? Because the first one is not S into S prime, and then you cannot compose with this one. So first, you have to have to get this, and then what you want is that when you take the composition, this composition is again a pseudo with a symbol, and now because this grows like M1. And this grows like M2, the composition has to grow like M1 times M2. So it will be like the ordinary composition of differential operators. So you have a differential operator for the K and one over the L. When you take the composition, we get K plus L. So you want the end here, and I will be very suggestive here because this will become an operator now, this sharp product that I write here. So I want my composition to be equal to a vile quantization of something which belongs in this class now. And uh, so that now my symbol, uh, the weight, the growth of the symbol will, will be a product of these two growths. Okay, and now the interesting thing is that this thing, this condition here automatically restricts the metric in a very specific way. And when you have that restriction, all of the oh, let, let me rephrase myself again. All the necessary restrictions that you have to impose on the metric will essentially come from this thing. Uh, this will force some kind of growth on the metric, and then, uh, the, in a sense, the first thing will automatic, no, not automatic, but it will fall. Okay, so. How you do this? So now I will. Uh, the next thing that I will do is directly lift from the paper for Mander. I'll just repeat his arguments, word for word, because you cannot do it better than the master. I mean, yeah. If one tries to do something better, you will probably end up with something worse. So I'll just <coughs> repeat the master now. Tricky. This is really tricky, but I'll just try to impress it on you. Aha, uh -huh. so I have to take my notes now. Sorry. So, one, two, 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 two. four, five, six. Aha. Uh -huh. So, what's the idea? The idea is the following. So, first, start with A and B in S, Rn. Not Rn, but R2n. 
previously, I, maybe I should, I, I didn't dwell on this too much, but let me phrase it again. Previ in the very beginning, I mentioned that when A and B are in S prime, then operators are always continuous from S into S prime. But when the symbols are in S, Rn, then the operators, in fact, are even better. So if your symbol is in, in a, not a tempered distribution, but a tempered function, then your operator is even better. It is operator from S prime into S. And this is because of the Schwarz kernel theorem again. Because the kernel, if you remember, was that it doesn't matter how it looked like explicitly. If you remember, the kernel was a Fourier transform is some kind of a variable, and then you do change of quantization. And when you take a Fourier transform or something which is in S, you get something which is in a guess again, and then you use the Schwarz kernel theorem. Schwarz kernel theorem says that mappings from S prime into S have kernels in S Rn, R to N. And that's it. So th these are even better. So all I'm saying that if A and B in, in S R to N, then this operator is certainly continuous from S Rn into S Rn. It's always continuous because, right? Because of this. And now the thing, uh, what Hormand did here, is the following thing. Uh, I won't go into details this because it's very tedious and very long, it's literally very long calculations. But the idea is the following. That you calculate the kernel of this. So you have the kernel of, of B, you have the kernel of B, you have the kernel of A. I already wrote them in the beginning. And when you have the both of the kernels of uh, B and A, you can combine the integral into one giant integral and you can extract from that the kernel of the, of the composition. You can recognize the kernel of the composition because this is a short not short, this is a Fourier transform, this is a Fourier transform. You have both of the kernels, you write them in a whole big thing, and you can ex write them as a four times quadruple integral, and you can literally it's a literally quadruple integral, you can extract the kernel of the of the composition. You can identify it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And now I won't go into details about that. Uh, incidentally, uh, one uh, side note, which is very interesting, you can do this thing without the kernels, but using phase symmetries. So if you're really good at phase symmetries and the symplectic structure on phase space, you can introduce this, for those that are familiar, this phase symmetries. Uh, for those that don't know these things, don't bother. these kinds of operators. Where is uh -huh. These are called phase symmetries and they're unitary operators. And the trick is that if you use those things, you can uh, write this product in a very elegant way, but it's very tricky. And essentially, this is the way that Bonnie and Lerner represented in, in their works, but it's far more trickier than what Hermander did. Hermander did the, the most obvious thing to do. You just write the kernels and you're not feeling lazy that day, you compute the integrals and that's it. You just do the computation. Mm -hmm. Of course, you have to be not lazy that day because otherwise, yeah, you give up. Uh, I was trying to do it by myself and I gave up, and then I did it for Monday. Uh, uh -huh. So, where's my contribution? Is it possible that I missed? No. Uh -huh. Okay, so you literally can extract from that the kernel, and the kernel corresponds to, so you extract the kernel from this thing, K, and on this kernel, you do the inverse, do the inverse Fourier transform to extract the symbol. You remember, uh, you, when you have a symbol, you can do the kernel, find the kernel by taking the Fourier transform and then doing this change of variables. You compute the joint kernel, and from the joint kernel, you extract the symbol, which I will denote it by A sharp B. So one Fourier transform and one inverse Fourier transform here. And what you do, 
when, when we get it, I'll, I'll write you down. So this is the thing that you get. I'll define my new sim, my A sharp B and product, sharp product. <coughs> now we precise with the constants. So the constant here is. Now comes the interesting thing that the symplectic, uh, uh, the symplectic form of the phase space appears here. And this is interesting again that the symplectic form naturally appears. change variables here. I'll put this thing to be my new x and this thing to be my new, no, not x, but new y and this thing to be my new z. Change variables. It's exactly that because in a certain in a certain way this is like a convolution of this thing of this phase factor with this right it's like a convolution right you have x minus y and y you have x minus z and z but convolution but then restricted okay so if x1 and x2 are different you treat them as different you take the convolution and then you restrict it when x1 and equal to x2 okay and now i'll change variables again here I'll take y to be minus y and z to be minus z. So this will become plus, this will become plus, and this is unchanged because you have two minuses. Okay. Now I'll rewrite this again. Uh, this is obvious, the next thing, but I'll, uh, I'll write it as an action of this distribution of two variables now. On, on this test function of two variables, x is fixed. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, let me write it one uh, once in this way, and then I'll rewrite this factor in another way. Again, this, uh, this action here is uh, with respect to the y and z variables. So you treated this as a, as a distribution of y and z, and this as a test function of y and z. And this is the, just the integral there. Again, x is fixed. And now uh, I'll rewrite this thing, because uh, you uh, be careful here that y and z are variables for which, to, for which we, you integrate with respect to. So this is not a, it's not a phase like the phase in the Fourier transform. This is a quadratic form now with respect to y and z. We have to be careful. This is not linear. I mean, this is linear with respect to y when you fix z, and it's linear with respect to z when you, when you fix y. But here, they are not fixed. They're, you take the integral with respect to both. So this is a quadratic form. And you can write this quadratic form. And this quadratic form has a very fancy representation, which involves the symplectic form of course, because the symplectic form appears here, but in, a, in this way. So I will use now a block matrix representation for it. So 
this is exactly uh, okay let me let me put them with the i with the i now this is exactly this zero minus sigma i will tell you what sigma sigma zero uh, acting on the yz and then taking the scalar product the inner product of yz so this thing becomes a quadratic form on r4n because you have a matrix it's of this form, a matrix times x bracketed with x. Because now it's R4n. Uh, now we'll have to tell you what the sigma is. The sigma is the linear map which is induced by the symplectic form. And I'll write it down. So, uh, here. So, the symplectic form is a just to recall it again, is a bilinear map R to N times R to N into R. And because it is, uh, it is of course, when we talk about it, it's uh, non-degenerate. And it uh, automatically induces a linear map from R to N into R to N. Right? Because every bilinear map induces a linear map. When you fix one of the coordinates, and then it is the mapping from R to N into the dual of R to N, actually, but the dual of R to N is again R to N, right? So this, this induced linear map is denoted by sigma, and I can tell you what it is explicitly. Sigma is zero the identity minus identity, zero. Because now, mm. if I take if I take x, y, so the linear form is actually is identically equal to the linear form on x bracketed with phi, with uh, uh, with the other one, right? This is the definition of the linear map induced by the linear form. And when you take sigma to be this, you get exactly the inner product. I mean, you have to plug in and you check it. So if you define sigma like this, sigma x uh, bracketed with y, this bracket just means the linear product. I don't know why. Right brackets. So when you take uh, sigma to be this, you take sigma of x and you multiply it with y, you get exactly the the the, sim, the symplectic form. And now this sigma is the one that appears here. Okay. And now what you do is you use Perceval. You take Fourier side of this and you take Fourier side of this. And in front, there is a constant of 1 over 4 pi of, of whatever, which I don't care. Something which I, I don't even know what I have to put there for the Perceval to hold. 1 over 2 pi to the, I don't know what, to the power, probably to the power of whatever. Something. And is equal to the Fourier side of this, uh, bracketed with the Fourier side of this. Uh, remember, the Fourier side is with respect to yz, because now it's a it's one, yz is one variable, and now here you have a, a Fourier side of a pure imaginary exponential, and this can be computed. So you have a Fourier side of something like this, e to the minus i a x times x, something of this form, right? Because my a is here, my x is this, and this is the same x again. And there are formulas for this thing. You open the Her Hermandres book, you find a formula for that.
And the thing is that it is equal to Xi, uh, Xi. So, okay, so this is Xi, but with two dimensions Xi. So this is the capital Xi, right? Uh, I think this is the way you write capital Xi, as far as I know. So please correct me on this. So the capital, because it's two variables. Uh, Xi times the inverse of the sigma, of that sigma, of Xi1, this is Xi2. And then you write the Fourier side of this thing, and then because here you have a Fourier side of uh, something which is translated by x, so we have some kind of a modulation inside the form, and this thing will be this integral, aha, uh -huh, which I will now write it here in its full glory. So let me write it there. Get that exactly that. Aha, there is a missing here, of course. Okay. And now, uh, of course, you recognize that this thing is exactly this. And now I'll write it, and then we'll talk about it. What does it mean? Ah, uh, the inverse. I have to write it. Uh, I mean, when you take the inverse of this matrix, you have a minus here and a plus here. Sigma minus one. And now you look at it and you recognize that this thing is exactly the action of this operator. I'll first write it and then we'll talk about it. Fourier multiplier. So this is nothing else by, but by the, I mean this is the definition of this thing that I'm writing down. So the definition of this thing is the following. So e to the power i half uh, dx1 dx2 that x on something, let me call it, I don't know, capital phi of x1, x2 of two variables. This now belongs to S on R 4n is by definition integral on R4n 
of I just substitute xi1 and xi2 here. And then I take the Fourier site of phi psi one psi two. Right? This is the ordinary definition of a, a Fourier multiplier, right? And this Fourier multiplier, because it is purely imaginary, it's continuous operator on S R four n, right? And and this formula is exactly this. So this is exactly what you do. You take the action of this thing on now phi of x1 and x2 is a of x1 and b of x2. So this is the Fourier side of it. And then uh, you take, you, aha, the, the Fourier, and then I have to take the inverse for that, yeah. I was missing an inverse Fourier. So first I, I take the Fourier side, I multiply it with it, and then take the inverse. Yeah, that, that's why I was missing factors. Sorry. Sorry, it was stupid. So I take the Fourier side, I multiply with it, and then take the inverse Fourier side. No. Inverse Fourier. So this is e to the power, aha, uh -huh. uh, minus psi1, x1, uh, inverse for that, so this will be plus. Take the Fourier side, multiply with my Fourier multiplier, take the inverse Fourier. Uh -huh. Okay, we are finished now. So, uh, in five minutes. So, this thing is exactly this. Right? Because here's your inverse Fourier from x xi1 and x, now it's x1 and x2, two different variables. Here is the same, but let us assume that they're different. x1 xi1, x2 xi2, which go outside. This is that factor. This factor is here. And this inside here is the Fourier transform of your A times B. It's your Fourier transform minus I, uh, I Y psi 1 minus I Z psi 2. And then, uh, once you, uh, okay, so this, again, so this is exactly uh, this operator. But once you evaluate this operator, then you restrict when x1 is equal to x2. So you first you evaluate the operator, and then you restrict that x1 is equal to x2. Right? Because that's why here you get the same x. So uh, the thing that I get at the very end is that a sharp b is exactly this action of this Fourier multiplier. And, but so first of all, I act with it, and then I restrict when, when the two variables are the same. Okay, and this is the, the symbol of my composition. And uh, everything here works because A and B are in S. First of all, immediately notice that this thing is meaningless if A and B are in S prime, because then this thing doesn't matter, doesn't has, it just doesn't have sense. Of course, we know that it, 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 must, it must not have sense because we know that operators cannot be, you cannot take composition, but yeah. So this means that we are on the right, right track because you cannot do this with S prime functions, but you can do it with S functions. And the tricky thing is now, what conditions do you have to impose on your growth of the metric so that you can do this thing when A and B are in uh, your symbol classes? Right, and this will force uh, a condition of the metric. So more generally, what <coughs> what you can do, and this is the and from from there the other condition of the metric will uh, appear. What you do now, 
Isso. Viva da Paulo. Do study. The action of this kind of Fourier multipliers. Or more generally, what Hermann did, he studied the action of a Fourier multiplier of this form. Where this B is a quadratic form. On a very general, so quadratic form applied to one function, and then, so this phi of x will be this x1 and x2, and then this thing restricted to some uh, linear subspace of wherever this x is. So this thing restricted x restricted to a linear subspace. And my linear subspace where I restrict x is the linear subspace of R4n where x1 is equal to x2, so on the diagonal. <coughs> and this is what Hormander did. Uh, for very general b. My b, in my case, is the thing that I erase here. <coughs> Uh, yeah, uh, so, so this was the, this thing here, and if you remember, this was the action of this zero minus sigma sigma zero acting on uh, yz times yz. So this was my bilinear form. And the trick is, and now I really cannot, uh, I cannot show this why, because now you have to go to the whole Hormander paper, because this is like the, the meat of the Hormander paper, is that when you, when you work out the details, you find what's your condition on the metric. And the condition is boiled out in the following. So again, the trick is that I want, uh, when, I, when I apply this operator to something which belongs now, this phi of, again, so this phi of x for me will be a, of the form a of x1, b of x2, and now this, let me write it like this, this is now an element of commander class of, this is m1, but m2, right, because now this has uh, four dimensions, right, because this x1 is bounded by m of x1, this is bounded by m of x2, but now I treat them separately, like a tensor product. And now my, my metric on this four-dimensional metric with some four-dimensional space, my metric is the one that is generated like this. I'll denote it like, like G. And this G of X, Y is G of X plus G of Y is split. And you can show that this is in the Riemannian metric again. And you consider this space now. And you consider this operator on this space. And the question is, when I can, when I evaluate it, when I can do the restriction. To restrict, so do, I'll do the evaluation of this thing and restrict x equal to y. Right? So again, I evaluate it. So first of all, you have to be able to evaluate it, to, 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 to compute it, and then to restrict it on the diagonal. And this imposes the condition on the metric. And the condition that imposes are the following. So the interesting thing here is that the, the, these conditions that are, because I, I could just start the talk with writing down the conditions of the metric, but then it will be pointless. Yeah, why, why those conditions? Why not something else, right? So the, the, the trick is that you don't have choice. The, the, the whole thing, if you want your calculus to be meaningful, you don't have choice. It, it forces you to restrict the metric in this way. And this is the fascinating thing. I mean, that's why the whole theory is fascinating. The trick is that you don't have choice. So I'll, I'll spare you from the gory details <laughs> and just write the, the conditions. 
So there are two conditions. And the first one is that your metric G of X has to be always less smaller. So this means, okay, so G of X evaluated at T, so this quadratic form, has to be always smaller than this symplectic duo, which I'll tell you now how it is defined. Where this I'm finishing you one minute. Uh, it's always less than gx of sigma is always less than, is, I mean, is by definition uh, the supremum of uh, s in r to n of uh, the symplectic form ts squared but divided with gx of s. So this is the definition of gx sigma. So you take the symplectic form squared, but you divide it with gx. So somehow you norm, you norm the symplectic form by the metric. And this norming of the symplectic form by the net metric again produces another metric. And then you, you can show literally by hand. And this is very easy to show it, but I know that I don't have time because I don't have to end. But it's really simple to show that this gx sigma is again a Riemannian metric. So that means for us that the inner products parameterized by x. This is the one con first condition. Uh, for me, this will be the third condition. The second condition that in, the first condition that imposes is that gx of t has to grow at, at most, at most polynomially with respect to the symplectic dual. So this means that Cn, so that uh, the metric with respect to x, when you divide it with uh, the metric at, uh, evaluated at t in x and in y, the, the, the ratio it is, it is at most polynomial with respect to the symplectic dual. And these are the two important conditions. Once you have, these are the things that are immediately, that, I mean immediately, that are uh, imposed by this requirement of this quadratic form to be continuous on, I mean, this Fourier multiplier to be continuous on this kind of space and to be, to be able to evaluate it at the diagonal. And uh, that's it. And now there is one extra condition. And for this extra condition that you have to impose, I cannot give you justification. I just don't know the justification. For Mander just imposed it. I know where it is used, but I don't know the justification for it. Uh, I mean, I know where I, where I have to use it, but I, I cannot explain why, why it is imposed. And this is the fact that the metric is slowly varying. That means that uh, when the points are very close, the metric cannot vary too much in the following sense. So there is a resistance R such that if gx of x minus y is small, so when you take uh, the norm of x minus y rooted at x, if it, this is small, then the ratios of the two metrics are bounded by a constant. Uh, to a positive to power or to a negative. So if that ratio or the other one, this are bounded by a constant and the constant is universal. This is called slow variation because, in a sense, it tells you that when x and y are close, then the metric cannot vary too much. So it doesn't matter which uh, 
uh, where you root the metric there, whether at x or at y, it's the same thing. But I cannot give you a justification for this. Uh, I think that I have to end it there, right, Michael? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> if, if somebody knows a justification, I mean, when I say justification, I, mean, I know where I use it. I know where it is used, I know where, but I cannot tell, tell you, aha, uh, this is the place where it breaks in the, the, the construction if you do not impose it. For the other two conditions, I know, because they come from this part. Okay. okay. Uh, oh, thank you. Thank you very much. Any comments, maybe? Questions? Yes. Maybe, maybe I should have just uh, over there uh, wrote a book about that, and he, he didn't write what this was really commander, and he started with one. <laughs> this is the order of our conditions one, then two, and three is the last one. <laughs> So this is it. Uh, I can comment on this. Uh, Hormander in his paper, the first thing that he starts is he writes the condition, this condition, and then he just uses it down, downwards. He doesn't explain but it. This must be somehow with temperature. Uh, 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 probably is the fact that otherwise the metric will, too, will vary too much, and I don't know. I, I cannot it explain. Well, these two conditions, you can explicitly find them in the proof of Hormander. I mean, the thing that I said before. The other condition is just something that. Commander just states it at the beginning and just, yeah, the calculus works. With this, he has partition of units, mm -hmm. for example. And not just that, but also construction of parametrics. And par parametrics. Because the paramet construction of parametrics requires that kind of a slow variation. So, the interview will give us the example of the, what is the metric which doesn't satisfy the classical one and. Uh, uh, sorry, again, the, uh, the metric which. Another example that like, uh, satisfies all these things, but not the classical one, right? Uh, aha, a, a metric which, which satisfies these things, but it's not of the classical ones. Ah, this is very interesting. And I can give you even an example of an operator, which probably I will talk about this foreshadowing for tomorrow. Uh, I have to find, aha, uh -huh. so this thing. Uh, me and Stan consider this thing, and I will just uh, directly steal this thing from my paper, from our paper, I mean, that's not stealing, but yeah. Uh, so here's an interesting operator. I know this is very simple, but it's very interesting. So here x is x, small x. And now I, I'm not sure how well acquainted you are with elliptricity and global regularity of operators. You, you know, just bring, yeah, vaguely. That's enough. That's enough. So the trick is the following. Is this operator elliptic in any symbolic calculus? Because if it is elliptic in a symbolic calculus, then you can construct a parametrics for it. If the symbolic calculus is good enough. And the trick is that if your metric, your metric, g of x psi, is of a bilis type, but the bilis with the restriction that psi is bigger than c, because this is like a really crucial restriction there. We talk about that the, the restriction of phi is less than constant was not crucial, because if it is bigger, it's even easier the calculus. But this is like a really uh, crucial restriction in order to develop the theory as Bill C. did. Then uh, the theorem is okay. So the theorem is the following: uh, there does not exist. Um, uh, Hermander metric. Aha, when I say Hermander metric, I mean metric of this form. There does not exist a Hermander metric for which this symbol is elliptic. So if your psi is bounded from below, this symbol is always not elliptic. You can show it. But if you define your metric Metric like this, 
uh, this will generate a Hermander calculus where this operator is elliptic. And it exists a parametric, and then you can show that it's flat cone, and you can compute the index, and you can show that it's uh, isomorphism on S, it's even isomorphism on S prime, and you can do all fancy things. So the trick is that this thing cannot be a metric of a Bill Sefferman type because the weight psi, because my weight psi is psi over x, is not bounded from below. So the, the, the things that you do there just fails. Although, technically speaking, it's still not the same form, right? Yeah. yeah, it's a bit cheating, right? It's a bit cheating because it's still not the same form. It's phi and psi. But the, the trick is that you, you cannot use the classical uh, approach because the classical approach just doesn't work with these kinds of things. You have to do what Hermander did there, and I hope I'll talk about this tomorrow, how you prove the continuity. The main task, as usual, is to find the metric and prove that it's yes. Yes, that's the trick. To find a good metric and you say, aha, this is a Hermander metric, and then... But again, all the normal things you do is, is with a split metric, like this. Okay, thank you, Bayan. So we'll be looking forward to the next lecture. Uh, I think tomorrow. Uh, okay, so I think that this is uh, this concludes our program for today. I think we have uh, we have uh, cakes in, in the <coughs> for cake break in different cakes from yesterday, and uh, that the room where we'll have this. Uh, Cakes is the same as in the PhD office, so I said.